Hi, and welcome to Living Life. Uh, in today's Living Life, we're going to be looking at a passage that talks about uh, one of the kings in Judah. And uh, it's during this time of the divided kingdom. But uh, one thing that I want to highlight as we begin to read the passage is this idea of the word legacy. Now, the word legacy, it's, it's a word that uh, really came to me during my college season. I had a mentor figure in my church who one time asked me at the end of a season, he said, what is the legacy you leave behind? And he, he had us listen to the song uh, by Nicole Nordman, and it goes, uh, I want to leave a legacy. How will they remember me? Did I choose to love? Did I point to you enough? And as we dig into today's passage, we'll begin to wrestle with the idea of what is a legacy and what does that have to do with our passage today? So let's dig in. Second Chronicles chapter 28, verses 1 through 15. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. Unlike David his father, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel and also made idols for worshipping the Baals. He burned sacrifices in the valley of Ben-Hinnom and sacrificed his children in the fire, engaging in the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He offered sacrifices and burned incense at the high places, on the hilltops, and under every spreading tree. Therefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hands of the king of Aram. The Arameans defeated him and took many of his people as prisoners and brought them to Damascus. He was also given into the hands of the king of Israel, who inflicted heavy casualties on him. In one day, Pekah son of Remaliah killed a hundred and twenty thousand soldiers in Judah, because Judah had forsaken the Lord, the God of their ancestors. Zechri, an Ephraimite warrior, killed Messiah, the king's son, Ezrakam, the officer in charge of the palace, and Elkanah second to the king. The men of Israel took captive from their fellow Israelites who were from Judah 200,000 wives, sons, and daughters. They also took a great deal of plunder which they carried back to Samaria. But a prophet of the Lord named Oded was there, and he went out to meet the army when he returned to Samaria. He said to them, Because the Lord, the God of your ancestors, was angry with Judah, he gave them into your hand, but you have slaughtered them in a rage that reaches to heaven. And now you intend to make the men and women of Judah and Jerusalem your slaves. But aren't you also guilty of sins against the Lord your God? Now listen to me. Send back your fellow Israelites you have taken as prisoners, for the Lord's fierce anger rests on you. Then some of the leaders in Ephraim, Azariah son of Jehonanan, Berakai son of Meshilamoth, Zehizkah son of Shalom, and Amasa son of Hadlai confronted those who were arriving from the war. You must not bring those prisoners here, they said, or we will be guilty before the Lord. Do you intend to add to our sin and guilt? For our guilt is already great, and his fierce anger rests on Israel. So the soldiers gave up the prisoners and plunder in the presence of the officials and all the assembly. The men designated by name took the prisoners, and from the plunder they clothed all who were naked. They provided them with clothes and sandals, food and drink, and healing balm. All those who were weak they put on donkeys, so they took them back to their fellow Israelites at Jericho, the city of Palms, and returned to Samaria. Welcome back to Living Life. As you saw in today's passage, it shows a story of a king, King Ahaz, who didn't leave behind the most impressive of legacies. And we're oftentimes tempted to blame it just on the individual, but oftentimes we neglect their childhood or even their other influences, their parents, their grandparents. And I think if we look at Ahaz, we see a failure that didn't begin with him, but in fact it, it began even further before in his past. And when we look um, in Ahaz's grandfather, uh, we see King Uzai who was very, very successful in so many, many ways. He was successful in war, he was successful in uh, wealth, in produce, and he, in all sakes, of, for, uh, in the eyes of the world, he was very, very successful. 
Unfortunately, there's a moment that really defines it from, a, from God's perspective. And it's in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 16. And it says, But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God. And this is one of those moments that we see echoing repeatedly in the book of Chronicles. We see it with every king as they're introduced. Uh, it says, a king was born, was X number of years old when he became king. He reigned for so and so years. And then we have a theological statement that happens next is, how did God view this king? Did he uh, honor God in his life? Or was he faithful or unfaithful? These are the two questions that uh, come to mind. And with Ahaz, it's very interesting is he's introduced as a very unfaithful king. He did not walk in the ways of God uh, as his father did or his grandfather did to some degree. But it says that he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Now, what we say about the kings of Israel is there was no king in Israel that honored God. Uh, and that's the rebuke and the rebelliousness of Israel. In Judah, there were a few kings in the line of David that sought to honor God, but Ahaz was not one of them. His legacy that he left behind was not of uh, leading people in worshiping God, but in fact, leading people in idolatry, leading people to turn away from the Lord. When we, when we look at Ahaz, it says he made idols to worship the Baals. He did human sacrifices uh, a detestable practice of the Canaanites. And if you remember in, uh, in the Exodus, what happened is God brought the Israelites out of Egypt and he saved them and he brought them into the land of Canaan. And he says, I want you to destroy these people because they are uh, worshiping idols, they are doing detestable things, they are doing human sacrifices, uh, things that are not right in the eyes of God. So we see Ahaz many, many years later, following in the wrong footsteps, not honoring God as David had done, his, his great ancestor, but instead following the ways of the evil kings of Israel. And we see, uh, we see some errors happening from his father. It says uh, Jotham did not put away the idols uh, when he became king. And we see Ahaz taking that a step further and not just not putting away the idols, but worshiping the idols. However, in the midst of all these failures, we do see God's grace. And we see it at the very beginning hinted at with the name David. Now remember, David is a king who was after God's own heart. And God honored him, God loved him, and God promised to David that his, from his descendants, there will be an uh, everlasting kingdom. What we see is that with the hint that of uh, the hint mentioned of David, we see that God is promising that his promise will endure. And we see that uh, when Judah loses the war and they get carried off into exile, there's a sudden mysterious prophet who comes out of nowhere named Odin. And he rebukes the Israelites who had taken these southern uh, Judah people and he had, they had taken them as their captives, as their plunder, as their spoils of war. And instead, he rebukes them, saying, how could you do this to your own people, to your own brothers? And we see in it grace, because the people of God respond, and then they return and release the captives and the plunder that, according to all the standards of warfare, they rightfully deserved. So we see God's mercy, we see God's grace in the same situation. And we see, even despite the disunity and the brokenness between north and south of the kingdom, we see God still preparing a unity and God still seeking to restore uh, people that are broken. And uh, uh, probably one of the most important takeaways for us is this idea of legacy. What is the legacy we leave behind for ourselves, from uh, our, to our children, to our great grandchildren, etc.? Do we allow for different idolatry in our life that will influence our children in how they understand how we have walked with the Lord, or do we choose to walk faithfully now and leave that model and that legacy to our children and to our descendants? So let's spend some time in reflection. In 
the beginning of this li living life, I mentioned the word legacy. It's what do we leave behind? What do other people remember us by? And in it, I, asked, I was asking myself is, how am I living today? Is the legacy that I'm leaving behind for those who follow after me or who live after me, do they remember a person who loved the Lord, who walked with the Lord? Uh, or, did I, or did I leave behind a model of love? Did I love others? Did I point with my whole life to Jesus? And I pray that I have, I have, and I will keep walking this journey. And I encourage you to keep fighting the good fight of faith. There's a, another part, of, another set of lyrics in that song with Nicole Norman's legacy that I want to read before we pray. She says, I was not well-traveled, not well-read. I was not well-to-do or well-bred. Just want to hear instead, well done, good and faithful one. I pray that that would be our prayer. Let's pray together. Father God, we want to come before you and we want to reflect on the life that we are living today. Help us to know uh, how we are walking with you, O oh Lord, how we are walking this life. Help us to be able to discern uh, the calling that you have placed on our lives as well, O oh Lord. So Father, I pray that you would give us a somber uh, reality check today and I pray that you would encourage us to walk with you from today onward again. In your name we pray. Amen. This program is produced by the listeners of the audience.